What is up, AP Human Geography students? Let us slice and dice Unit 1. Without further ado, maps! It's kind of the intro section. And maps will consider time, space, and scale. Obviously, this is a way to measure what's happening when, which is before the other. Space would be things relative to other things and how we use and allocate our resources slash physical area. That was a lot of hand movement. And then finally, scale would be the, the amount to which we are zoomed in or zoomed out. If we're super zoomed out, that would be small scale. If we're super zoomed in, that would be big scale. Types of maps will be reference versus thematic. Reference maps will say, okay, this is how many Starbucks are within this many uh, miles. A thematic map will give you a genre of things to look at. So for example, we could be looking at uh, outbreak and diffusion of diseases. So this one is gonna be more about genre and this is gonna be about objects relative to other objects. Information. So absolute and relative direction. Absolute would be latitude and longitude. This is exactly where you go coordinate wise. And relative would be, all right, this classroom is closer to this other classroom. So it's relative to this other object. Density would be how many units per. Concentration would be how spread out they are. So a highly dense area would have lots of people like New York City, 20 million people. Concentration would be how spread out they are in that area. Clustering is, is sort of a function of whether or not we are dense over a given space and time. Uh, this is usually referring to how we use land in rural populations. Some cities are very clustered, others are not. Dispersal would be how separated we are, so dispersed settlements would not be concentrated. And then elevation is obviously relative to sea level, so highly elevated areas are going to grow different crops, probably different businesses will be fostered, you know, it's kind of a different calculus. Flaws of maps generally, almost always on the AP Human Geography exam, you want to go straight towards distortion. Most maps, like the Mercator projection, will be highly distorted at the poles and the Robinson projection. Remember, pro tip, you'll differentiate the two because the Mercator projection will have straight lines, a constant compass bearing uh, in all directions for latitude and longitude, and then the Robinson projection will be slightly curved lines. Uh, hopefully, there'll be a projection here to demonstrate my point. Centricity would be where objects are on the map. So if Europe is the center of the globe, that's obviously kind of weird because we're a floating sphere in space. So the notion that Europe or the Americas would be the center of our Earth at all times is kind of a weird object. And then clearly that distortion, I kind of forgot to bring this up, is related to shape, area, distancing, and direction. So any of those variables can be distorted variables if you ever have to provide examples of what exactly is distorted. This is where you go. The power of data. So this would be how you would use this data to accomplish your objectives. Right now the census is happening, so that allows us to figure out funding for schools, political appointments, uh, at least allocation of Senate, or excuse me, of representatives in the House of Representatives. So that's pretty rad. We'll use satellite imagery to figure out kind of where people are also, just to keep in mind. So this is kind of how data is used in three different genres. For politics on the AP Human Exam, we're going to look to gerrymandering. So when the census occurs, the, the politicians in a specific state will look at who's living where, then they will reallocate and decide how many representatives certain districts get, and they'll actually redistrict. They'll redraw the lines and figure out you know, where the districts are for political advantage. Whatever party's in power will continue to perpetuate their advantage. That's called incumbency advantage with an eye. And then uh, gerrymandering occurs, which is this idea of intentionally redistricting to maintain your political power in the future. Uh, personal, so home shopping. We obviously decide uh, what types of stores go where based on who's living where. So we get a Publix in Alachua because, uh, you know, 10 years ago, not a lot of people lived here, but now all of a sudden there are enough people. The market is big enough to justify. And then that kind of ties really nicely with business, which is based on the central place theory, we look to this data to figure out what the maximum range, how far people will travel, and the size of the market necessary for specific businesses. So we make personal buying decisions, we uh, decide how we vote, and also businesses operate based on this data. How to gather data. Seems simple. If you're going to use technology because you live in the modern world, you'll almost certainly rely on, did you see this? Local vendors supporting the local economy. I guess it's a franchise though, so I'm not sure that qualifies. Whatever. Uh, GIS is this idea of using uh, geographic information systems, thematic layers, satellites, and remote sensing to figure out what exactly is in a specific location. GPS is more about tracking where an object is in space and time and how to get somewhere. So this would be like the Google Maps situation navigational tool. Remote sensing is using satellites to actually figure out where something is. 
online mapping versus visualization. This is the kind of the modern, modern world which blends these ideas uh, it, it, and allows us to figure out what is actually happening where. I think of it as, you know, your everyday life. You know, when you use Google Earth, you're kind of blending all of these, and that's kind of the concept of online mapping. Written technologies to gather data would be field observations. If you're like me and you carry around a field journal when you go out into the wilderness, I don't definitely don't do that. Uh, that would be an example of that. Media travel narratives. This would be kind of like your travel blog. Uh, policy documents when the government says, okay, we're going to remove restrictions, regulations on the EPA uh, in the moment because the economy kind of needs that sputtering. That's what we're talking about. Uh, interviews, this would be, you know, actually broadcasting your opinion through media and the government does something about it as a linkage institution. Landscape analysis, looking at the topography. Are we talking about hills, swamps? You know, that's kind of our analysis. And then photographic analysis would be, let's take some pictures and decide what's happening, where. Do we like it? Maybe. Almost done. Hang in there. So the human environment interaction. Clearly we care about these issues of sustainability. Will we have prolonged use of the land? Uh, you know, how are we affecting the environment pollution? And the allocation of scarce resources, despite the fact that we have unlimited wants and needs. It's kind of a dramatic affair. Theories, environmental determinism versus possibilism. This is the concept that our culture is dictated by the environment we live in. So because it's hot, we like sandals. Possibilism is our technology allows us to adapt and kind of mitigating or reducing the effect of the environment. So, for example, because we have air conditioners and screens and, you know, even sandals to some extent, we can choose, choose to defy the environment. I can wear a sweater outside because my feet are so cold. I don't know if that's 100% true, but you know, the example we use in class like a million times, I wear these ridiculous flannels because I'm in a cozy air conditioned environment, which I definitely could not do outside. That's possibilism. And things like our architecture, uh, you know, cultural practices are massively impacting how we live and sort of reducing the effect of the environment's influence on our daily lives. Scales to consider. Global would be worldwide. Regional, which would be, you know, like a, the South, for example, or the Sun Belt. National would be the state level. That means like the United States, not Florida. And then local would obviously be within your community or county. The flaws of scale are kind of more about what isn't depicted. So for example, if I give you a data point, and we've discussed this before, and I say that Florida's population is 16% black, that doesn't really help us. And you might recall how majestically terrible this image is. And also this data point is super unhelpful because we don't know where African Americans live. We don't know what concentration, what density. We certainly don't know, you know, what exactly this data means. So please keep in mind, any data is subject to this idea that we're not sure what the scale is actually telling us. So please try not to assume too much because that would make a, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Spatial analysis. Absolute location refers to where an object is, latitude, longitude. Relative is where something is related to something else. How we consider space is of utmost importance. It's going to be a big part of this 2FRQ exam, I believe. And I would rely heavily on cultural landscape. How are humans affecting the landscape such that they are reflecting their culture on the actual space? Where are objects relative to each other? What language, what religion, what cultural practices are exhibited on the actual land that humans have caused? Place, what's the significance of a special place, like a sacred object such as a church? Uh, flows would be migration flows that could be chain migration, that could be step migration, gravity, uh, you get the gist. Patterns, you know, there are a lot of models we can look to for patterns of how objects are related to another, like the least cost theory, for example. And then space-time compression kind of negates this idea of distance decay. Because we have modern technology, I can literally, oh, this is not my cell phone. I can literally call, uh, you know, my friend in Japan and say, hey, what's up? It used, it used to take months and now it could take literally seconds. And then finally, distance decay. It's this idea that as space increases, the level of interaction decreases. So it's kind of this inverse relationship. More space, less interaction. Woo! Regions, regions. The last section of Unit 1. Formal, functional, vernacular. A formal region would be a political boundary, such as Canada. If it's politically recognized by the UN, it's almost certainly a formal region. 
functional would be based on a node or a hearth. So, for example, your Wi-Fi router, your pizza delivery room. If it's limited by the distance or range of this node, do you like this motion? Then it's going to be a functional region. Vernacular, perceptual, these are cultural regions, how we pronounce things, what are our preferences in daily life. Do you brush your teeth with water on the toothpaste and toothbrush, or do you do it dry like a psychopath? That's kind of your choice, and it's totally related to probably the culture of your perceptual region. Disputes uh, lead to subsequent and consequent boundaries. So this, do you remember what these mean? A subsequent boundary would be it, it occurs after culture or is evolving with culture. As political units, as formal regions argue, then the boundary might change, like Vietnam's northern boundary changed a lot uh, due to political systems and constant infighting. You may recall this from a history class, perhaps. And so, uh, you know, we change our boundaries to reflect our perceptual differences. Devolution is this idea of power trickling down to lower governments to create autonomy. Devolution is good in that regions get to decide what's happening and how they're going to do it. It's a little risky in that it means you're relying on your own resources as a local unit to get the job done. So Florida is kind of stuck with our current amount of revenue from taxes to deal with Florida's challenges, issues to overcome. Good and bad. Balkanization is the breaking up of a political unit due to centrifugal forces, usually ethnic differences, and the famous example is going to be Yugoslavia. And then finally, refugees, IDPs, or war. Clearly these are not good things. A refugee is someone who's fleeing from a conflict of some kind, sometimes seeking asylum. Uh, an IDP is internally displaced, so sort of like a refugee, except you can't leave your country, you're stuck there. And clearly, worst case scenario is war, which is an escalation of all of these things. Fun times, unit one, ending with a climactic reference to war and also a majestic depiction of Florida. Have a wonderful day and uh, toodles.